And thank you again, Jonathan, for having me. My name is Marlon Schultz, and I'm a trusted estates attorney. Um, I'm licensed to practice uh, in California as well as Texas, and I'm broadcasting to you live from Brenham, Texas. Um, and if anything, or if any of you know anything about uh, Brenham, Texas, you know that we make really good ice cream out here. Um, today's presentation, uh, today's presentation is going to be about avoiding California probate. Um, and uh, basically, we're just going to take a 30,000 foot overview of what California probate looks like um, and what are the kinds of things that you want to do to try and avoid it. Um, it was Benjamin Franklin, I think, who was quoting a French revolutionary when he said there are only two things that are certain in life, and those two things are death and taxes. And, you know, depending on what side of the tax code you find yourself on these days, that, that last part might not even be true. And so today what we're going to talk about is basically what I, what everybody in my office calls the great equalizer. This is the thing that we know is inevitable that nobody is going to get out of going through. Um, and how uh, how the mechanics of, of what happens after somebody passes look like uh, in California as it relates to uh, California probate. So um, this gives you a little bit about my educational pedigree, um, and you can read through that at your leisure. There is a QR code here uh, at the bottom of the screen. There are so many participants today, there's really no way that we're going to get through all of your questions at the end of this. Um, and so if you have questions uh, that you want to have asked, um, go ahead and scan that QR code and uh, schedule some time with me uh, so that we can discuss what your uh, what your question or concerns are. Um, so this gives you a little bit of information about me, um, but honestly, the reason why I uh, chose estate planning as uh, the area of law that I wanted to practice was because when I was in my 20s, I lost my father uh, to um, a very predictable and very terminal uh, disease. And my mother ended up going through a probate proceeding with a lawyer who really didn't treat her very well and wasn't very engaged in the process, had really bad client side manner. Um, and we actually found out when she went to go sell the house later that this lawyer had forgotten to record the deed evidencing the transfer out of my dad's name and into uh, just her name. Um, and so that kind of pushed me towards wanting to do something better uh, for my clients because I had been through that, watched somebody go through that, and I swore up and down we would never go through something like that ever again. Um, and so that's really my motivation to do this and also to give presentations like this to all of you wonderful people. So what should you expect for the next 45 minutes? Um, and again, there's that QR code. It's going to be at the bottom of every slide. Um, for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to do my best to keep this as entertaining as possible. I do know that it, it is 420 today in San Francisco. And so um, because this is being recorded, I guess that means that if you've, if you've already enjoyed part of the day today, um, you don't have to worry about missing anything. Um, and in terms of entertainment, what we're going to be doing is uh, basically just defining uh, what that probate process in California looks like um, and what are the common issues with probate and how do we go about avoiding them? Really, avoiding probate in California is going to be your number one goal if you are a California resident. Um, and we'll talk about why it, that is exactly. Uh, we're also going to have uh, a discussion of the components of a very well-rounded estate plan, what every Californian should have. Uh, at their fingertips in terms of that estate plan. And if there is any time left over, we'll go ahead and take a few questions from the chat. Now, the chat is live, um, and Jonathan said that he would be monitoring that for us. Um, but again, if you have any questions that either you don't feel like discussing in front of a group setting, uh, that's 100% understandable. Go ahead and scan that QR code. Or if we just don't get to you uh, by the time this uh, is slated to end, we can always uh, schedule some time later. The one thing I do want to say, though, uh, just as a disclaimer, um, I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney, and I think that that's really important to sort of uh, flesh out here, that really um, I'm not giving anybody any legal advice today, that everything that we're going to be discussing here is going to be a 30,000-foot view of what California probate looks like, um, and because it's not legal advice, it also means that we're not creating an attorney-client relationship, um, and I just want to make sure that that's really clear. So without much more ado, let's jump into the meat of this. Um, so what is probate? You know, you hear that word tossed around a lot when people pass away. And the reality is uh, probate is basically the court ordered process of winding up somebody's affairs when they pass away. Um, and in short, it means that um, we're going to be appointing an administrator or an executor, um, which is the person who um, establishes what exactly the property in the estate is. They marshal those assets together. They work with a court-appointed probate referee 
um, to assign values uh, to those items that are in the estate. Uh, they work uh, to identify errors to make sure that we know where those things are going. Um, and then once the court approves all of that paperwork, um, then we make a final distribution at the end. Um, and that's actually when your probate attorney in California gets paid. Um, so, you know, more broadly, again, it's just the process um, of administering an estate. So you must be saying to yourselves, okay, well, it sounds so simple. <laughs> You know, this sounds like a very simple process. And the reality is, is on paper, it is very simple. Um, there are just, a, again, a couple of steps. Somebody passes away. Somebody shows up in court and says this person has died. Um, we start marshalling assets. We start identifying heirs. Um, and then we make final distributions and everybody gets their things. The lawyer gets paid and everybody goes home. And that's that's pretty much how it works out. However, um, in California, uh, probate is... Um, it's a really long and drawn out process, unfortunately. Um, these are some reasons why you're going to want to try and avoid probate. Um, first, it can take years to complete. And I mean that in a very literal sense. The average time it takes to complete a probate procedure in California is 12 months. So you're talking about 12 months from the day that you set that first filing in court, about 12 months later, maybe longer. Um, you will be stepping out of court and being done with this. The final distribution will be had, your attorney will be paid, and you can go about your life. Um, the problem, though, is that depending on what county that you may have uh, passed away in or, or your estate seems to reside in, um, that can take much longer. And if you have assets in multiple counties, uh, that probate procedure is going to take obviously longer than that. Um, and if you have probated uh, assets in other states, um, now you're opening probate in California in whatever county. Um, and then again, in the county where your uh, other assets in other states may lie. And so that 12 month period can actually inflate itself to about 18 months and sometimes two years, three years. And that's assuming that everything is identifiable, that all of our heirs and beneficiaries agree to the terms of things that are being split up. And there are no arguments about um, where things are going or how they're going to be distributed. And that is usually the case that people are, are very content to just get their share, um, but sometimes people fight um, and that can be uh, that can be a really expensive process, which actually leads me to my second bullet point. Um, it is expensive. Uh, the California uh, legislature has set the probate fees that your lawyer can charge you by statute. Um, and that is based on the total amount of property attributed to the California estate at the time of death. So think about this from the perspective of, well, let's say, let's say that you have a $1.5 million estate in California, which basically means that you may have a parcel of real property. Maybe you have a retirement account. If you live in San Francisco, it means that you own a shack somewhere, uh, probably in the sunset. Um, and it's probably a beautiful place. Um, but the problem is uh, now that you have a $1.5 million estate, once you've passed away, that all needs to go through probate. And the total fees that you can expect to pay on a $1.5 million estate is somewhere in the neighborhood of $55,000, $56,000. And that is divided up. One half that goes to your executor or your administrator of the estate. Uh, the other half goes to your attorney. Um, and again, um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty steep fee. Uh, and a well-rounded estate plan will probably cost you about 10% of that. And again, um, much more control over a well-rounded estate plan and hardly any control over a probate proceeding. Um, and that's also something that you want to avoid. Um, also, you know, the probate process is very public. So all of that information that I just described, you know, the, the list of assets, the list of heirs and beneficiaries, whether or not people are arguing about these things, all of that is public because all of it has to be filed in court. Um, and so anybody, and I do mean anybody, can go to the San Francisco uh, public records. They can go into the civil court, into probate court, and start asking for records um, about your probated estate. Um, and so that means that if you have heirs or beneficiaries that are um, uh, subject to being scammed, if they're highly suggestible, <clears throat> or perhaps you have uh, somebody who is on means-based public benefits, um, all of these, all of these are the kinds of things that that can lead to disastrous effects, and they they can literally find out who your heirs are, how much they're getting, and when they're getting it. Um, that is also something that you really, really do want to avoid. And again, I think the last reason why you want to avoid probate 
um, is that you care about your family. You know, uh, your family is one of the most important things that you will ever have in your life, if not the most important thing. Um, and I can say from, again, personal experience, watching my mother go through this, again, very, very tragic situation with this lawyer, um, you can avoid all of that. Um, the other thing that you may want to consider is, you know, whether or not whether or not your family member has to show up in court and start testifying to family and marital history. Um, I've seen that happen as well, and that's generally something that happens in a California probate proceeding. You have to have somebody stand up and discuss the family and marital history of the of the person who's died. And if that's a surviving spouse who's having a really hard time going through that, um, standing up in front of a judge and testifying to those facts may not be something that they really feel comfortable doing, or nor do they want to do. Um, so again, a really well-rounded estate plan can take care of a lot of that. Um, again, does not take years. It's not expensive. It's not public. Um, and it definitely shows that you cared uh, about your family. So let's assume that you've completely avoided my advice. You said, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. Or you just get a will. Let's say that you just have a will. Wills still need to go through probate. Um, so let's talk about some of the common mistakes that I see people do or some people making when we start talking about probate and um, the kinds of things that come up in probated estates that I think are also very avoidable. Um, first, there's not enough liquid in the estate or that the beneficiaries can't afford to buy each other out. The number one way I see this happen is when you have uh, like a family house, like a family home, and there are multiple siblings. Um, and let's say that you have one of the siblings who stuck around and took care of the elderly parents. Now they're living in that home. Um, but because they took that time out of their lives to care for their parents, they don't have a career like the rest of the siblings do. And there is no way that they can afford to buy out the other siblings so that they can maintain their house. OK, so they can maintain their residence. Um, when that happens, that's a problem. Um, it means that sometimes beneficiaries can become houseless. Um, it also means that uh, beneficiaries um, end up selling something that might be very, very uh, sentimental and meaningful to them, such as a family home. Um, and that can that can cause some problems, that can cause some rifts uh, in the family. And you, you really do want to avoid something like that if you can. And there are ways and techniques uh, to avoid that kind of uh, occurrence. Um, another thing that happens quite frequently is that beneficiaries do not get along or they are suspicious of each other. And I know that everybody wants to think that, you know, they and their siblings will all always get along. But the reality is when somebody dies, all of the emotions come out of the word work. There's really no way around that. Um, the things that, you know, didn't matter that happened 20 years ago will all of a sudden be the reason why people will stop talking to each other. And I know that that sounds very strange, but it happens quite a bit. Um, it also means that if one of those beneficiaries is also, let's say, the executor of the will, the administrator of that estate, it can also mean we're leading ourselves into the land of litigation because one beneficiary may not trust the other beneficiary who is also the executor, who are also the administrator of the estate, and they can start litigating uh, regarding whether or not this uh, uh, this executor is doing a good job, whether that administrator uh, administrator is doing uh, the, the right thing in terms of dividing things up properly. These are all avoidable things. You do not need to do this and you should not open the door for this kind of thing. Um, and you should never assume that your kids are going to get along uh, as they do now because you're alive. Uh, that can change very, very quickly. Um, another reason why you are, or another issue that I, I commonly see with probated estates is that the distribution of assets can force a disabled beneficiary off of their public benefits, or it forces them to disclaim uh, their distribution to remain on public benefits. Now, recently, California has removed uh, those income calculations uh, from the administration of Medicaid, which is great. Um, and so that means a lot more people do not have to worry about this, this kind of thing. Um, but if you are on food stamps, if you are on uh, social security uh, disability, this is going to be one of those things where you really need to think about, you know, is this going to be a problem? Are these kinds of are these kinds of distributions going to be a problem? Um, the other thing that you really want to make sure that you're not doing is that you are giving property to somebody who literally doesn't have the capacity to manage it. That is also um, something of a problem. Um, people without capacity. 
um, generally are those that are mentally ill uh, and those that are under age. And I know that that sounds strange, but under the law, you can be incapacitated by virtue of you being less than 18 years old. Um, and so that is also something uh, to watch out for. But again, if you are on means-based public benefits and those means-based public benefits uh, have resource and income thresholds, uh, receiving a distribution of that property can uh, knock somebody off of that. And so that is also something that you want to avoid <clears throat> as much as you can. And so let's say that let's say that you've decided, okay, um, Marlon, you have scared me <laughs> into the idea of getting a living trust or some sort of estate plan um, so that I can avoid all of this. What should that estate plan include? Um, at a very bare minimum, your California estate plan needs to include something called a revocable living trust, sometimes referred to as a grantor trust. Um, a revocable living trust names your successor trustees. It uses very concise language for distributions and has backstops for the what if. So let's talk about what that means. So when you start naming your successor trustees, what you are saying is, when I pass away or if I become incapacitated, I want these people and these people only to administer my estate when I've passed away or when I've become incapacitated. It's really important. Um, money can sometimes cause people to behave badly. And so what you want to do is you want to find the people uh, in your life that you know make, <clears throat> excuse me, really good adulting decisions or if they don't know what they should do, they find the adult in the room who does know uh, what to do next. Um, what we don't want to do again is we don't want to have a um, you know an intestate uh, estate. When I use the word intestate, that means that somebody died without having a will. Um, and in that sort of instance, that means that anybody uh, can apply uh, to become that person's administrator. And typically, it's a surviving spouse, although it can be children next of kin. But the reality is you don't want people fighting over who has the reins over your estate. If you know who those people should be, write it down, put it in a trust, make sure that your successor trustee list is known. Um, it also, again, your trust should have concise language uh, for distributions. So instead of saying, I want my, my descendants to have all of my things share and share alike, which is actually really common um, in will-based estate plans, that language, now we have we don't we don't know who your descendants are. We need to identify those people. That becomes a problem. Uh, share and share alike may also be a problem because what if what if one of the things is a house and the rest of the things are just things? Um, how are we dividing this? You know what what is what is going where and how is that going to work out? You can give very clear and concise information to your successor trustee about exactly what you want to have happen. You can say point blank, I want my house to be liquidated. I want my children to split their proceeds. Boom, it's done. There's no fighting over this. Um, you can say, um, I have a life insurance policy. I want the proceeds of that to go to child one, and I want child two to keep the house. Um, you can say anything you want, as long as it's within the confines of the law, and as long as it's something that uh, the trustee has uh, minimal problems administering, you won't run into problems. Um, and simple is better. Uh, I can say that definitively in terms of that. Simple is absolutely better. Your trust should also have language in there that talks about the what ifs. Uh, generally speaking, um, you're always going to want to have language in there that says, you know, if my trustee knows or suspects that one of my beneficiaries is suffering from a drug or alcohol problem, I want them to be able to claw back their distribution. If they know that that beneficiary is going through a divorce and we don't want the property and trust uh, to be counted in, uh, in that divorce decree, we can claw back a distribution for that. Or if we know that a beneficiary has creditor problems, that would also be a reason to give the trustee the power to claw back a distribution and make sure that we are not paying creditors, that we are growing this estate and we're keeping it uh, for that purpose and that purpose only. So those are just some three really basic things that your trust can do. Um, and again, uh, anything that is held in trust, provided it is titled property or properly, I should say, um, avoids probate. You should look at your trust as though it is, um, it is like the magic box. When you put things in the magic box, it makes it over uh, the, uh, the date of death without having to go through probate court. And that's really important. Um, the next set of documents uh, that every Californian should have um, are healthcare directives. Um, our, our office typically uses three uh, healthcare directives. I've seen people sort of roll their physician's directive and their HIPAA all into their uh, healthcare directive. I like to do three, three standalones myself. 
But your advanced healthcare directive, um, it's it's what we call a springing document, although it does not necessarily have to be triggered by any particular event, but typically they are. Um, advanced healthcare directives typically wait for you to be incapacitated before the people that are listed in those documents can start making medical care decisions on your behalf. Um, this can be um, anything up to, um, you know, what kind of medications you do or do not want to be treated with, and it can include that end of life care. So if you're in that persistent vegetative state and to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, you're not coming out of it, this document and your physician's directive, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, should give the medical community as well as your agents uh, under, that, uh, under that document, very clear and concise language as to what they should be doing in that kind of situation. Um, a HIPAA authorization is always a good thing to have on hand. Uh, a HIPAA authorization is simply a document that allows the people that you have listed in it to access your medical records in the event that they need to. Um, this is typically a document that does not require a finding of incapacity before, uh, before the powers uh, go into effect. It usually goes live uh, once you sign it. Um, and again, it's just really important. There may be uh, instances where you uh, have capacity, but you may not be ambulatory. Uh, I have a friend of mine who actually fell off a mountain in Lake Tahoe. I don't know how that happens. Um, but apparently it does happen. Um, and unfortunately for him, he was stuck in traction in Truckee. And somebody had to drive to Truckee to get his x-rays and drive them to the specialist in San Francisco. And this was, of course, way before internet was uh, in existence. So I know I'm dating myself on that. Um, but in those kinds of instances, he absolutely had capacity, but there was no way he was getting out of that full body cast just to drive to uh, San Francisco with his x-rays. So again, a, a good document to have on file. Your physician's directive, again, it's sort of the sister document to the advanced healthcare directive. This will absolutely need um, some formal finding of incapacity before anybody can make medical care decisions for you uh, about end of life care. I wanna be really clear, this is not a DNR. A DNR, a do not resuscitate order is generally something that you sign at the facility level. Um, and it's usually reserved for people that are in their nineties or people that have a terminal illness and it's very clear that they should not be resuscitated. Um, the physician's directive does give very clear, uh, concise information to your agents as to what your preferences are in the event you are in that persistent vegetative state. Um, so I, I'm also going to date myself by saying this, but uh, probably about 20 or 30 years ago, there was a woman in Florida. Her name was Terry Schiavo. Um, and Ms. Schiavo, unfortunately, ha had an accident that put her in that persistent vegetative state. Um, and the medical community uh, consulted with her husband, and they both agreed that um, she is likely never going to come out of this, and she never wanted to be in this kind of state long term, at least that's what her husband said. And so they made the decision collectively uh, to, to end and terminate uh, life, uh, life support. Um, unfortunately, her parents stepped in and filed an injunctive or and filed for injunctive relief in Florida. Um, and they litigated for 10 years whether or not they were going to uh, end that uh, that end of life, or I should say terminate her end of life care. Um, 10 years is a long time to be in a persistent vegetative state. I'm sure everybody here can agree to that. But um, that's not the only thing that you need to think about, although that is a, a major factor in this. You also need to think about what 10 years of litigation costs look like and 10 years of health care costs. Um, that that can drain your estate very, very quickly. And if, it, it, if it's your goal to make sure that your heirs and beneficiaries have a legacy from you, then this is a document that you absolutely should be signing. Um, another thing that you may want to consider, and this is basically a conversation that you should be having with your elderly family members, um, if you are in your 80s or 90s, uh, CPR is incredibly traumatic on an elderly body and to a point where they have to press, they have to compress your chest cavity about two and a half inches to make a full chest compression. Um, and that is devastating to an elderly body. And even if they do come out of it, um, their quality of life, if they had one to begin with, is gonna be much reduced as a result of that happening. Um, so make sure that you talk to your elderly relatives about what their preferences are for that as well. Um, that is very important to note. Um, another document that you're going to want to have is sort of uh, sort of like a cousin to the Advanced Healthcare Directive. Um, it's called a Durable Power of Attorney, and this is a springing document. It will require, um, or at least in my office, I should say, it does require a formal finding of incapacity. This allows the people that you have listed in that document to make 
decisions about your finances and about your property. So basically anything that you can do with your property today is something that your agents under that document would be able to do on your behalf. <clears throat> the great thing about that though, is that if you've picked the right adults, right? If you've picked the same good adults uh, that make good adulting decisions and know where to find uh, the adult in the room to do the right thing uh, when it comes to making those kinds of decisions, then this is not going to be a scary document to sign. If you have picked questionable people to manage your finances and property when you're incapacitated, this is going to be one of the scariest documents you ever sign. I'll be I'll be very brutally honest with you about that. Um, basically, what you should think about this document is having the power to do anything that you can do with your property as well. So that's anything from taking money out of your wallet and giving it to a homeless person, excuse me, all the way up to putting a reverse mortgage on your house and everything in between. Um, and so it's just really important, uh, again, that you've picked the right people uh, that have the ability to manage those finances and those property uh, pieces uh, when you're incapacitated. Um, the other document, the last document that I want to uh, talk to you to or you guys about is um, the guardianship nomination for minor children. Um, as a parent, this is going to be the most important document you will probably ever sign outside of your own estate planning documents. This document allows you to choose who your permanent and temporary guardians are for your minor children. Um, it also gives direction for their education and it can allow you to express any kind of aspirations that you want to have known about how you want them to be raised in the event that you are either incapacitated long term um, or you have passed away uh, unexpectedly. Um, I don't I don't know uh, much about the California Child Protective Services uh, uh, Agency. Um, I can tell you, though, that, you know, if you've lost your parents, you're already having a very, very hard time, especially if you are a child. It, it is it is much harder when you don't know where you're going to be going, who is going to be taking care of you. Um, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time in the hands of a CPS agent. Um, that is very traumatizing already. Um, so having this kind of information at hand really helps to sort of, you know, close the loop on those kinds of things happening and really make sure that your children are placed in the hands of the right people uh, at the time that they need that, uh, that kind of placement. So now that we've talked about what the components of a California estate plan should include, let's talk about what a California estate plan should accomplish, okay? First and foremost, you want to avoid California probate. Um, and again, the only way you're gonna be able to do that is by making sure that your beneficiary designations are filled out, uh, by making sure that you have uh, either transfer on death deeds or uh, you know pay on death designations added to your bank accounts. Um, Frankly, the best way, in my opinion, is to get a revocable living trust and to fully fund that trust. Trust funding basically means that you are retitling assets out of your name as an individual and putting them into the name of the trust, or you are changing the beneficiary designations on, like, say, your life insurance policies and your retirement accounts from individuals to the trust. Um, even if you have a beneficiary designation filled out, technically that will avoid probate, but if the people that you've listed have also passed away, i.e. the beneficiary designation has not been updated, then that means that that asset is gonna go through probate as well. So again, naming a trust is a really great idea. Trusts don't die. People die all the time. Um, and so I do recommend, again, probate avoidance. Uh, there, are, there are fancier ways to get around it, but there is no better way than to do this through a revocable living trust. Um, your trust, again, your California estate plan should um, use very concise language to identify your trustees. Again, you really want to make sure that the lineage of people um, that you've chosen um, are the only people that are managing your affairs after you've passed away. Um, it is just so important. And you also want to make sure that that lineage is known to people who may argue uh, that you've uh, chosen those people. Um, the reality is, unless your trust was signed under duress, um, they're not gonna be able to, um, uh, to get those successor trustees off of that list absent some sort of bad acting on their part. Um, another thing that your California estate plan should do, uh, it should absolutely clearly identify your heirs and beneficiaries. Again, do not use an estate plan that says, I want this all to go to my descendants to share and share alike. Name your descendants, name who they are. Do you have two children? 
name them, give me your, their birth dates, let the court and anybody else who's interested in this know these are the people that I'm referring to. And if not to them, then to their descendants. Um, make sure that that is very clear and concise. Um, you can also name charities. That's another that's another great way to um, uh, to get rid of assets if you need to. Um, charities uh, sometimes go out of business, unfortunately, but there's always language in there that says, you know, to this charity or to something similar. So there will always be a path, um, even if that charity uh, no longer exists. Um, a California estate plan should also uh, accomplish effective transfers of your property with the with the express purpose of reducing conflict. So, for example, if you know that you have an asset that you, your two kids are going to fight over, you need to make a decision. You need to make a decision as to who is going to get that and who is going to get something else in lieu of that. Um, don't leave it up to them to duke it out in court. Don't leave it to them to ruin their relationship with each other uh, just because you couldn't you could not put the the, the pen to paper on this. Um, avoid the conflict at all costs. Believe me, conflict is expensive. It takes a lot of time. Um, and that's another way that your estate can be spent through is by your your trustee or you know whomever uh, having to litigate against whoever is attacking uh, the distribution. So if you can avoid that, you should. Um, the other thing that you are going to want to do with your California estate plan, and we didn't really talk about this, but um, it should reduce or eliminate uh, your exposure to tax. So let's talk about that. Right now in California, there is no inheritance tax. There is no estate tax that's levied. Uh, so when somebody dies, that is not a tax that's levied uh, on a decedent's estate. But uh, the federal government has said that if you have $13.61 million in your estate when you pass away, that $13.61 million and first dollar will be taxed at 40%. So for every dollar over that, you will be taxed at 40%. Um, you should have language uh, in your estate plan to reduce or eliminate that tax exposure, uh, if at all possible. And there are ways to do it. Um, and a lot of you may be sort of, you know, scratching your head and saying, Marlon, I and nobody I know, myself included, has $13.61 million. And I, I understand that. But the tax code is slated to change at the end of 2025. And so that $13.61 million figure per person is actually going to be reduced to somewhere we think probably $6.3, $6.4 million per person. And again, you may be saying I'm nowhere near hitting that. But when you factor in a piece of real estate in San Francisco, let's say one or two retirement accounts um, and maybe some personal property and maybe some inheritance from, from somebody else, um, it's actually not hard for a Californian to inadvertently hit $6.5 million without even knowing that they're there. So I do recommend that, again, you need to be very conscientious of what that tax code is going to do at the end of 2025. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take a look at how your properties are titled. So, for example, um, if you have a piece of real estate in San Francisco and it's you and your spouse that have purchased this piece of property, what you don't want to see on that deed is joint tenants. Um, if you see that it's you and your spouse as joint tenants, that means that when the first of you dies, you get a step up in basis to current market value. OK, and that means that uh, if you decided to sell your surviving spouse decides to sell that property the day after you pass away, your capital gains exposure has been eliminated, essentially. Uh, capital gains, as you all know, is the tax that you pay on the profit that you make on the sale of something. And so let's say that you bought your house at $1 million. Um, your spouse passes away uh, as of the date of death. It is now worth $2 million and you sell it the next day. You're not going to be paying any of that capital gains on that $1 million. You're not going to be paying it. Um, what you do want to see, though, on that deed is you want to see um, community property with rights of survivorship. Um, and the reason why you want to see that is because, up, again, upon the death of the first spouse, you get that step up in basis to current market value. And then when the second person dies, it gets another step up in basis to current market value, thereby eliminating all of the capital gains uh, tax exposure from the day uh, that the purchase uh, was made uh, to the date of death of the second uh, spouse. And that is that is really key. Capital gains uh, it can be a nightmare to deal with. And frankly, if you can eliminate it with just some retitling of property, that's that's money well spent as far as I'm concerned. OK, so now that I've talked to you off about probate and what your estate plan should have and what it should accomplish, 
the next thing you should be talking to yourselves about, if you're talking to yourself at all, um, you want to talk about what you should look for in a California state planning attorney. Um, personally, I think they should all look and speak just like me. You should call my office immediately. Um, and I'm kidding. I'm not kidding, but I am kidding. Um, but in terms of expertise, what we're really talking about is subject matter expertise. Um, they really need to know about estate planning. Estate planning should be a core practice area at their firm. What you don't want to get yourself into is a situation where you have a general practitioner who knows enough about this and knows enough about that, but doesn't really know um, about the nuances of how to put together an estate plan that matters. Um, I've seen people get into a lot of trouble with this, and it's literally over something as simple as titling. And I know that that sounds strange, but if you don't know how to title an asset, um, that can lead you uh, into uh, some problematic areas. It could mean that maybe your house wasn't actually funded into your trust, or it can mean maybe you're not getting that second step up in basis. Um, so again, if you don't have a good estate planning attorney who has experience doing this and that this is the core focus of what they do, you may wanna consider looking someplace else. Um, you also wanna make sure that they have experience with the tax code. Now that does not mean that they have to be a tax attorney, but they do need to know about the Internal Revenue Code. They do need to know about the California legislation that leads to your taxation in California. They need to understand how that works. Um, if they don't understand how that works, that's a problem. You, again, you can, you can run into some pretty nasty uh, taxation issues that are avoidable because they just didn't know what they were doing. Um, and you don't want your heirs and beneficiaries to figure that out the hard way, um, especially when you know that you can do something better. Um, and in terms of the attorney, and again, I'm, I'm saying this from personal experience, um, if you have an attorney that is not paying attention to what you say, if it feels like you are not being listened to, um, if it's clear that you are a line item on their spreadsheet, then I recommend that you turn around and you find yourself a new attorney. Um, when you go to get your estate plan completed, um, they need to be asking you really, really intrusive questions about your family dynamic. And I know that that sounds strange, but the reality is if they don't know about the dynamics of your family, they're not gonna be able to put together an estate plan that reduces conflict. They're not gonna make sure that they don't, and this is you know, this is kind of what we talk about in the industry. They don't wanna put the proverbial drunk uncle in charge of the kid's trust fund. And that can happen. If you are not being asked those questions, that can absolutely happen. Um, and also sometimes, sometimes people need to walk through their relationships with their relatives and really examine whether or not it's a healthy relationship to begin with, whether or not this person should even be in charge of a trust. Um, and so again, without, without having an attorney who is willing to make that deep dive with you, I don't think that that's a good estate plan that you should be putting into effect. And I don't think that's an attorney that you're gonna wanna go with. Um, and again, they should be asking you questions about how your property is titled. Um, if they're not asking questions about that, again, maybe this is not the right uh, attorney for you. And last but not least, and I say this a lot to my clients, if you don't get a good feeling from somebody, walk away. There's there's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, most attorneys will give you, you know, 15, 20 minutes of free time. So that way you can uh, get a feel for them and they can get a feel for you. Believe me, us attorneys, we do want to make sure that the people that we're taking on are not crazy. Um, and so you can bet that 15 minutes that we give you is definitely checking you for that. Um, but we want to make sure that you get a good feeling from us too. And that's that's really the whole point is making sure that this is not a transaction. This is a relationship um, and it should be a relationship that you build for the long term um, because an estate plan should be a living document. This is going to be a document that changes with you as your life changes over time. So every time Every time somebody gets married, every time somebody dies, every time that there are children involved, every time uh, every time there is a major life event, every time that there is a change in the tax code, either they should be talking to you or you should be talking to them, but there needs to be that connection made. Um, and you're not gonna have that connection if you don't have a good feeling uh, from the attorney that you're speaking with. So again, just make sure that you're, uh, you're really getting a good feeling for that. So um, now it looks like we've got about 20 minutes left and I know that there are some questions in the chat. So what I'm going to do, um, again, that QR code is there. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan and uh, Jonathan, if you wanna give me some of the questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to see if we can take a deeper dive. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Marlon, that was great. Um, no problem. So, um, Kathy had asked, do renters who don't own any real estate need to take steps to avoid probate? 
Yes. Yes. Um, because again, you your estate can end up in probate uh, by virtue of owning anything. Now, granted, if you fall below a particular dollar amount, a dollar threshold, and I want to say it's 160, 185,000, something like that. If you have less than that in your estate, we can we can probate your estate through something called the small estate administration. It's uh, technically uh, an affidavit that says um, this person passed away. They don't own anything more than this. You would present that affidavit to various financial institutions where the property was found, um, and they would relinquish that property to you. That is a legally binding document, and it doesn't require stepping into court. But if you have a piece of real estate um, and it's not, let's say it's not, I, I actually have a client right now who has a piece of real estate in San Bernardino that's worth maybe $30,000, which is unheard of, right? How would a, a piece of real estate in California ever be worth anything less uh, than maybe $150,000, $200,000? But he found it uh, and then he died with it, unfortunately. Um, that's the kind of thing that you would have to go to court through because you you really do need to you know clean up that chain of title process and that will require um, unfortunately, a court proceeding to do it. Um, but I do recommend that if you are a renter and you have a bank account, make sure that there is either another person named on that bank account, like a co-tenant, uh, so that they can absorb the property when you pass away. Or you can also put um, a pay on death designation on any kind of bank account that you might have. And you can list whoever you want uh, to be the beneficiary uh, of that bank account. And that would avoid probate that way. Great, thank you. Um, so Heidi was asking, I need to add my three adult children and pick one or two in charge. I'm divorced, not sure what to do. My brother sold the family home. No talk about buying the home. Mm -hmm. um, that so, sounds like a lot. <laughs> yeah, that, maybe. Um, so the first part of the question is about um, picking someone to be in charge, um, uh, ha having three adult children. Um, so uh, the one thing, the one, and this is again, not legal advice, but broadly speaking, um, the one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to name all three of them because now you've got three cooks in the kitchen and that can create a lot of confusion. Um, the other thing that that can lead to is if one person is a bad actor, that means that all three of them, uh, or, or I should say the other two, can actually absorb some of the liability because the presumption would be if you're a co-trustee and you knew this was happening and you didn't stop it, that is also uh, a liability problem. So what I would recommend uh, in any kind of situation for any of you, if you have uh, multiple children and you're having a hard time to decide, you need to pick the one who is the most financially responsible. Okay, you need to pick the one who understands what it means to actually do this and to do it well. There is financial acumen involved in this. Um, being a, a successor trustee does mean making hard decisions too. That's another thing. Um, so they do need to have uh, good diplomacy skills because sometimes that means having very hard conversations with your beneficiaries. So um, if you have a child that fits into that category, name them. Um, you can also uh, ask that, you know, if you have one child who has good financial acumen and the other one has good diplomacy skills, um, you can put the financial acumen child in charge of the trust, but but say that it is your wish that they consult uh, with the diplomatic one uh, in terms of making hard decisions, just to make sure that you have a good spread uh, in terms of that, uh, in terms of shouldering that responsibility. That's a really good question. All right. Um, can you recommend books that would be helpful in detailing the probate process and how to avoid it? Oh goodness. Um, I. I... You know, there there are some there are some no low publications out there that will spell out, um, you know, what probate in California looks like. Um, off the top of my head, I do not I do not have the names of them. Um, but no low is a really good publisher. Lexis Nexus is also a really good publisher. I would recommend talking to Jonathan here at the public library. Um, I know that the San Francisco Public Library does actually have a legal section. Um, and it's beautiful. Uh, and it's uh, it's there for your use. So I would recommend. Uh, consulting those kinds of things. I do get a lot of questions about whether or not you should DIY your estate plan. And I have to be honest with you, I don't think you should. And I'm not saying that because I have a profit motive. I mean, I, I will absolutely recognize that I have that, but there is a cottage industry of attorneys that do nothing but fix problems with estate plans once somebody has self-drafted them. 
um, because you just don't know what you don't know. And frankly, this is kind of one of those areas where you should be spending the money because if you spend it now, your children, your beneficiaries will not be spending the money to fix it later. Um, and that's really key. If you really care at all about, you know, the smooth transition of things, get a professional. You know, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask your, like, I don't know that you would actually go onto YouTube and try to figure out how to replumb your entire house. Um, <laughs> so maybe don't do this with your estate plan. Don't, don't go to YouTube or, or to other places to figure out how you should, you know, manage your estate plan, go to a professional, pay for the advice. It is worth the advice. If you find a good attorney, um, they will treat you right. And honestly, it's, it's something that you will wipe your brow and say, okay, now it's over and I can move on. Um, whereas if it's self-drafted, you have no idea what's going to happen later. Um, yeah. And uh, anyone who's interested about um, those titles, um, please reach out to the um, to our department. Um, I'll put the email in our chat again, um, and we can uh, direct you to some of those resources that, that Marlon mentioned. Um, let's see. The next question um, was I... How about the death tax in San Francisco? Is there a death tax in San Francisco? That's news to me. Um, as, as I stated again, really, the only tax that should be levied on your estate comes at the federal level. But there is no there is no inheritance tax in California, and there is no uh, death tax. So if that has passed, that is absolutely news to me. Uh, but again, if you have $13.61 million in assets, you should be speaking to an attorney anyway. Um, let's see. Um, what is the difference between a revocable and irrevocable trust? And how that's do you a, know which is better for your situation? Great. No, that's a really great question. So um, a revocable trust is something that you can revoke. It is amendable. It is alterable. You can change your mind about who your beneficiaries are. You can change your mind about how much you want them to get or all, you know, any of those kinds of components. You can absolutely change that. A revocable trust is something that is exactly that. It is irrevocable, okay? And so what that means is when you place assets into it, you have named your beneficiaries, the assets are in there, and you no longer retain control over those assets, okay? Um, an irrevocable trust is a really good tool if you are in that taxable estate situation and you need to get assets out of your estate before you pass away. Um, that would be the situation where you would use an irrevocable trust. Um, people have a tendency to think that you can put all of your assets into an irrevocable trust and you can avoid creditors that way. Um, you can do that. I'm not going to tell you that you should, though, because essentially what you've done is you've created a situation where your assets exist in a trust that you can now no longer access. You cannot be the beneficiary and you cannot change it. OK, so the irrevocable trust situation, honestly, I reserve those for my clients that have that taxable estate problem. But the revocable trust is really for like everybody else. Like that's that's the trust that I use for myself. That's the trust that I use for my family. And it's literally because, again, you want the ability to to uh, be able to amend and revoke this. You do want this to also be treated um, as though it's a disregarded entity for tax purposes, which uh, which is what a revocable trust uh, would be. Um, irrevocable trusts, uh, they have their own tax ID number. Uh, they get taxed at a very different level than individuals do. Uh, so if you have a revocable trust, it's taxed under your social security number. And that means that um, you're not paying any special taxes on it. It's just, it's like, it doesn't even exist as far as the IRS is concerned. Um, but if you have an irrevocable trust, it typically has its own tax ID number. Um, and the taxation rates on trusts like that, you know, that 40% number that we talked about uh, at 13.61 million, that actually occurs, uh, you know, in the low, or I should say in the $15,000 worth of income in a trust level. And that's that's a lot to pay. Um, and so if you don't need an, an irrevocable trust, if you don't have that kind of taxation problem, don't get one. It's not, it's not going to be worth it. All right. Um, the next question was, what about beneficiaries who are not U.S. citizens and do not have a social security number? Most bank accounts do not allow to add such beneficiaries. Okay. So um, if that's the case, if you have beneficiaries that are non-U.S. citizens and they don't have social security numbers, that's a really good question. I don't know that I've ever run into that before. Um, 
I, I suppose what you could do uh, if you're not interested in getting a revocable living trust, um, what I would do theoretically is if you had a revocable living trust, name the trust uh, as the beneficiary of the bank account proceeds and then have the trust uh, distribute out those proceeds. Um, but honestly, if that's the case, my guess is the only thing that you would be able to do is maybe maybe name somebody else that you trust who would be able to make that distribution then to that person. Um, but there are reasons why banks don't let you do that. And, you know, it's generally speaking, they're concerned about money laundering and terrorist activity. They want it, they don't want it to go to somebody that shouldn't get it. Um, but, you know, they're, that's probably the only workaround. I don't think I've ever encountered that before. Um, so that that's my only possible recommendation um, is just, you know, making sure that, you know, there's somebody that you trust that you've named that can maybe make that distribution to them instead. Okay. Um... So this was a question about uh, property titles. Uh, married, a married couple taking title as joint tenant without specifying with right of survivorship would be problematic. Would that be problematic? I think is. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't. It's not. It's not necessarily problematic. Um, but what it does mean is because you're joint tenants and there is no right of survivorship, it basically means that that person's property interest in that property goes through probate. It's not necessarily absorbed by the other joint tenant. Um, you really do want to have the joint tenancy language in there that says with rights of survivorship, uh, just to clear that up. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not a property attorney, uh, but I will say this uh, again. Retitling is not that expensive. It, it really isn't. It's the cost of a deed. I think that's maybe five or six hundred dollars plus your recording fees. Um, if that's the thing that's keeping you up at night, that's also money well spent. Um, if you do have a married couple, though, again, I would recommend getting rid of the joint tenancy scheme altogether and and declaring it community property with rights of survivorship. Um, because again, you, then you get that second step up in basis and you avoid all of that capital gains. All right. Uh, the next question, are CalPERS pensions included in living trusts? Generally speaking, no, uh, but the payouts will be. So if you if you wanted to make sure, like, let's say that let's say that you had that sort of thing and your beneficiaries were minors, that means that they're too young to inherit anything under the law. It would end up in like a court registry or something like that. And that that on its own is expensive to administer. What you would do is you would change the beneficiary designation on that to the trust. Um, in, in many instances, your pensions, uh, they extinguish after you pass away. So there may be no survivor rights to it at all. Um, and so in, in that instance, you would not have to worry about whether or not it was in trust because it wouldn't be counted towards your estate for uh, estate tax purposes or probate purposes for that matter. Um, but if you do have survivor benefits um, or if it does have, um, Oh, uh, excuse me. If it does, if it does have a beneficiary designation on it, um, you would name the trust in those kinds of instances. Absolutely. Okay. Um, where were we? Okay. In cases of bank accounts slash investment accounts with clearly defined beneficiaries, i.e., information provided to the bank, will the asset have to go into probate in the absence of a trust? No. So essentially what ends up happening, if your beneficiary designations are filled out properly and the people that you've listed as beneficiaries are living at the time of that distribution, then that will 100% avoid probate. Um, I recommend to my clients, however, uh, name the trust and, and name your trust as your primary beneficiary again, because what you wanna do is avoid a situation where if that beneficiary is not alive, then that is going to go through probate. If you, if that beneficiary is predeceased and for whatever reason you forgot to change it, um, that can be that can be a really big problem. Um, another problem again that I see, and I just want to make mention of this, I see a lot of grandparents leaving things to grandkids that way. Um, and again, if your grandchildren are not over eighteen, this is going to be a problem. They're not they're not old enough to actually inherit anything, and so their parents end up being, you know conservators basically of their estate um again and that's a that's a that's a proceeding that you really just do not want to get into it's expensive um it's very hard to manage so again if you have a trust name the trust uh there are a lot of backstop languages in those trusts for that reason so that if there are proceeds that need to go and find a home um it can do that without the administration of a court to do it all right um if i don't 
own properties here, but I do have properties internationally. Do I need to have a probate here in California? Um, so maybe they're asking, would would those properties, international properties, go to probate if they're not? Oh, um, yeah. Well, generally speaking, no. So, uh, so let's assume that you owned absolutely nothing in the U.S. and the only things that you owned were outside of the U.S. Um, I would recommend talking to uh, an estate planning attorney or the functional equivalent in uh, the country uh, where those assets are cited. Um, if you have a bank account in California, it'd be kind of rare to live here and not have some sort of asset here. Um, but I mean, if you if everything that you own is someplace else, then you really do need to consult with an attorney um, in that jurisdiction so that uh, somebody who knows those laws better. You, you don't necessarily have a California probate in that instance, but again, it really depends on what what you do have in California. Just because you don't have real estate doesn't mean that you don't have a probate estate. Um, and so that means that you really need to stay on top of that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I always speak to somebody in the country where those assets are cited so you know how to handle those things later. Okay. Um, someone was asking, are you contracted with MetLife? No, I don't. I am not. Okay. That's an interesting question. I don't know where they came from. <laughs> um, that was the entire question. Um, huh. okay. Let's see. So my mother put my brother and sister in my will. It was done to protect me at my divorce. I need to change it to just my three kids. Um, why would I want my siblings that do not really have a relationship be getting my money? Um, I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> I okay. don't know. Um, I, that's a good question. Uh, family dynamics, again, this is the reason why we have conversations with our clients about family dynamics and whether or not they're going through a divorce. Um, you can, I mean, wills are changeable. But again, if you're in California, you should not be using a will because you will go through probate. Um, just, you know, be sure to stress that because that will be something that you have to deal with and you don't want to deal with it. You just don't. It's it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Okay. Um... For naming a POD, do I need to provide the bank social security numbers of my beneficiaries? They are U.S. citizens and relatives to me. Uh, generally speaking, yes. Uh, but again, it really depends on the bank. So, for example, um, on my bank account, I have named uh, I've named my sister. I already I already know her uh, social security number. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, you would you would want to do that. Uh, they typically do require those social security numbers. The only time I've seen them sort of not ask for that is if the beneficiary is a minor. But again, you don't you don't want your minors to become beneficiaries. They're just not old enough to inherit something like that. So um, generally, they will ask for the social security number. All right, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to try to get through a couple more questions. But uh, just a reminder that Marlon has offered to um, answer uh, questions that we didn't get to. Um, that's that QR code down in the, the bottom left hand corner of your screen. And um, maybe Marlon, I can include that in our um, follow up email to absolutely. To absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so let's do let's try to um, answer you think one, one more question. Yeah. Um, okay. So can you place a beneficiary on real property title? Yes. Um, there are particular deed forms. One is called a transfer on death deed. Um, and essentially what ends up happening is, uh, you know, the owner of the house passes away and that it automatically goes to uh, the, the named beneficiary. Um, in some jurisdictions, so like in uh, in Texas, and I'm pretty sure they do this in California as well, they also have something called a ladybird deed. Um, a ladybird deed, it basically gives a present day transfer of the property to, uh, to the named beneficiary, um, reserving a life estate uh, for the donor of the property. And this is really useful in terms of Medicaid planning, uh, because what it does is it takes the property right out of that person's estate. We don't have to use it for Medicaid calculation purposes although that's not applicable in California anymore. Um, but yes, you can you can use those kinds of transfer deeds, absolutely. All right, well, unfortunately we're out of time. There was a lot, a lot of great questions there. So again, I will um, send everyone a follow-up email later with a link to the recording of this presentation. Um, and I will include um, the link to um, 
reach out to Marlon if you your question we didn't get to your question. Um, so um, keep an eye out for that. I'll also include a very, very brief uh, survey. It really helps us when you fill those out. Um, we use those to design future programming and improve on the services we offer. So please take a moment to do that. And yeah, I just want to thank Marlon for being here today. This was really great. Um, I learned a lot. Um, we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat there. Um, and thanks everyone for for showing up today. I know it's a, if you're in the Bay Area, it's a beautiful day out there. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you again for having me and thank you everybody for, uh, for being present today. I appreciate that. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, reach out to our department if, uh, if you have any questions about library services and uh, those books that we mentioned. All right, take care.